is demanding an investigation to Hillary Clinton and the Clinton Foundation. The amounts involved, the favors done, and the significant number of times it was done require an expedited investigation by a special prosecutor immediately, immediately, immediately. Donald Trump's newly minted campaign manager, Kellyanne Conway, goes on the record. Nice to see you, Kellyanne. It's great to see you, Greta. Thank you. Kellyanne, your boss wants a special prosecutor. Who does he think is going to appoint it? Because typically it's the Attorney General of the United States, and uh, she and FBI Director Comey have pretty much indicated that they are not going to do any more investigating. Donald Trump today got the support of his vice presidential nominee, the chairman of the Republican Party, Mayor Giuliani, and many other people who just want to get to the bottom of this. And to answer your question, Greta, I would hope that this administration, who called itself, quote, post-partisan and the most transparent administration in history, would do the right thing here, appoint a special prosecutor, so that all of us can know what's happening. Um, it doesn't look good, and it doesn't look good for someone who was already distrusted by a majority of Americans as dishonest and untrustworthy. Um, you, you've seen the numbers. You have more than half of the meetings uh, resulting of people who gave to the Clinton Foundation upwards of $156 million. And I also just think it's, I think it's untoward, but I also think it's lazy. Greta, as you know, members of Congress who raise money, they leave their congressional offices and they walk across the street to the Republican committees, as do the Democrats, frankly, to their party committees. And you make the phone calls there because you're not allowed to do it on federal property. We should not allow the State Department to be this concierge He's for foreign donors who want access to a Clinton Foundation that has little relationship to the State Department, period. Why do you think that FBI Director Comey said that uh, he basically shut down the investigation? Do you think it was political, or do you think that based on his good judgment and his experience as a prosecutor, that this was an investigation that should go no further? I'll try option C, Greta. I'd imagine that uh, Director Comey is just exhausted by Hillary Clinton. He went ahead and he gave uh, what he thought was a final report to go against indicting her uh, for, you know, for her email server, but made very clear to all of us in, in the public that he knows she didn't tell the truth, that she basically lied about using one device, lied about how many emails contained national security information, lied about how many emails uh, were, were classified, etc., and lied, you know, lied certainly by deleting them all. And so I think he's just exhausted by that, but that doesn't mean that as we learn more facts that he can't change his mind and that we can't go the other route, which is through a special prosecutor. Kellyanne, nobody knows polling better than you do, I don't think. So tell me this, why with all the pounding on Secretary Clinton about these emails for the last six weeks, and including just recently, that the numbers don't seem to change between your candidate and Secretary Clinton? Do you think the American people, American voters, don't care about these emails? I know they care about having a transparent, accountable, and honest government run by somebody who is also transparent, honest, and accountable. And I think these things take time to foment into public opinion. But Greta, I would argue that it's for all the reasons you just laid out is precisely why Hillary Clinton's floor and ceiling in the polling are so dangerously close together. For all of the advantages she has, for somebody who has not held a press conference in 262 days and there's no press outrage about it practically, why in the world is she not at 60%? Why isn't she at 70% among women? It's a great question. So there is a reluctance that you see in these polls that is holding Hillary Clinton back from really, uh, from really putting away Donald Trump. And I think you're going to start to see all the people who, who had an excuse to vote against her will now find more of a reason to vote for him. If you say to yourself, as apparently a majority of Americans do in the polling, Greta, that you don't like her and you don't must, must trust, much trust her, what in the world then can you say, but I think I'll vote for her? So that's really where a lot of these Americans who are on the fence, who are keeping her under 50 and 55 percent in most of these states um, are well, right now. Explain then your candidate's polls, because he, he doesn't have a very high number of favorables either. So explain his to me. There's such, a, there's such a difference in why Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump have unfavorable ratings. You know, with Donald Trump, you hear from people a combination of, I don't like what he said or how he said it. Uh, but for her, they think she lies for a living. They actually think that there's a separate set of rules for the, for the Clintons. There's always a, a budding new thing in their never-ending scandalabra. They, they, she always sort of reinforces her greatest negatives. And so with him, it's, hey, I don't like what he said or how he said it here and there, or I'm not sure he can execute and deliver because politicians never execute and deliver, so what if he's just the same? And that's why he's giving these very specific, solution-centric, policy prescription uh, speeches now where he, at these rallies 
rallies where he's telling people, here's my 10-point plan to reform the VA. Here's my four-point plan to destroy ISIS. Um, taking the case right to Hillary Clinton and the Democrats who have been in public office to explain why communities of color have, um, have unemployment rates and crime rates and homelessness rates that really are unacceptable to all of us as Americans. So I think for him, the reason that it sometimes is distaste for things that he says, but for her, it's distrust, which is a more fundamental character flaw. All right. Well, you caused a buzz this weekend over a possible shift in Trump's immigration plan, but Trump denied that his plan has changed. Here's what he said to Sean Hannity in a Texas town hall that will air later tonight. We've got some great people in this country. They shouldn't be here. They're still great people. All right. But we've got some really, really bad gang members and some horrible people. Start with them. Those people are going out day one. They're going to be the first order I saw. They're going out. I know this question has come up a lot. What about people that work hard, have been here a long time, they own homes, they they have their property? And this is a question everyone's going to want to answer. What about them? Do they have to go back or would you reconsider? We are going to follow the laws of the country. Kelly, and before I get to that, on Thursday we were expecting an immigration policy speech from Donald Trump. That has been taken off the schedule. It's supposed to be in Colorado. What happened to that speech? That's a speech that we inherited that was never even half form. There is such a complex issue, and he's very clear about what his thoughts on immigration are, that we want to get it right. He's taking the counsel of many different people, Greta, and um, he has said he hasn't changed. I have said he hasn't changed because uh, he wants to do a couple things. Enforce the law, which would take care of a lot of these, these issues, and then also uh, get rid of the criminals, and then find a humane and effective way Easy. to 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 um, address the issue that 11 million plus live among us. But also be fair to the American worker. Be fair to all of us who are either looking for jobs or are concerned about, um, or who are also concerned that employers maybe aren't doing enough to verify who is working in their businesses and living among us. Kellyanne, nice to see you. Hope Thank you, you for back. having me, Greta. Absolutely. Yeah. And the crowds are pouring in. Donald Trump getting ready to speak in Austin, Texas. Fox's car campaign, Carl Cameron, is live inside the Austin Arena. Carl? Hi, Greta. Well, there's an awful lot of discussion about immigration, but also the idea of a special prosecutor. Trump's had a quiet day. He's been in Texas. He's had a couple of private meetings, and he'll have a big rally here in Austin later tonight. You know, Texas is a red state. It's been voting Republican for president for the last nine cycles. Uh, tomorrow, he'll go to Mississippi, another state that's been solidly red for almost you know 30 40 years uh so for trump to be here is about raising money and it's about organizing the base and it does come in this week as you were talking to ms conway about where there has been uh, three states that were taken off the schedule uh the uh, immigration speech has been postponed because how you choose to describe it the trump original three major pillars of his immigration plan one build a big wall Two, deport all the undocumented aliens here. And three, a Muslim ban. All three of those things are now what Trump always said all of his policies would be, negotiating positions. It's important to remember, he says he's a deal maker, and he recognizes that in Washington, deals are going to have to be made. So that wall isn't going to go from the Pacific Ocean to the Gulf of Mexico. Trump himself has said, has said that there are mountains, where places where technology and not a wall would necessarily be required. On the idea of a Muslim ban, he's modified that to say that some certain countries might be temporarily banned, but others would face, quote, extreme vetting. So it's not a ban on all of them. And when it comes to the 11 to 18 million undocumented immigrants here in the country now, uh, he's talking about using existing law, which is to say, go after hardened criminals, repeat lawbreakers, etc., and get them out of the country. But after that, it's a little bit unclear. And there has been some talk about whether or not uh, Mr. Trump is willing to soften his positions a little bit and in keeping with the idea that these are negotiating positions uh, he may well and that might actually put more of the Republican establishment camp in his favor based upon a more favorable view that that might have with Hispanics and other minorities who see that see it as too exclusive in its former form and are looking forward to the evolved version of the immigration plan from the Trump campaign. Greta? Carl, thank you. And tonight, the burning question from the FBI reopen its investigation into the Clinton emails. Intelligence correspondent Catherine Herridge is here. Catherine. Thank you, Greta. Uh, the Associated Press has released a new analysis tonight based on records that were released to them of Hillary Clinton's schedule when she was Secretary of State. And what they found is that of the 84 donors for whom they had records, at least half 
gained access to then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Many of them were major donors, uh, well into the seven figures to the foundation. Um, her campaign has said that this is cherry picking. It's not a true reflection of how it worked, but it certainly feeds into this idea that if you paid money to the foundation, you had a better chance of access and getting your issue to dress. All right. Now, people think, I mean, there's no indication that uh, someone went to see her and that she changed her policy as a result of seeing anybody, right? No information so far, right? Not None of that, no. Okay. Mm -hmm. But presumably, and this, you know, this does have some value. She had her picture taken with the person when the person went mm -hmm. to see her because that's for common. And right. then, then you put the picture behind yourself on the desk and that has some value. It shows you have some sort of connection to somebody mm -hmm. important. So it does have some value in some instances. Well, one of the things that's come out in the emails is a lot more information about someone who is a key fixer but has often operated in the shadows. His name is Dennis Chang. This is someone who's had many hats for Hill and Bill, uh, Hillary and Bill Clinton. He worked at uh, the Clinton Foundation where he was able to secure a donor base of about $250 million. He then worked at the State Department as her deputy chief of protocol. He was sort of the gatekeeper who greeted heads of state, and now he's a finance director for the campaign. And what the emails show is this very tight relationship between Chang and longtime aide Huma Abedin. Just a second. And the reason that's important is that you see it was very seamless. Critics would say that the lines were blurred, and the way the information flowed back and forth between the foundation and the State Department and the fundraising crossed ethical lines. All right, here, here's my problem. Is that the campaign has come out and made a statement, I'm going to take the last mm -hmm. words, made a statement basically saying this is outrageous, this is unfair. Mm -hmm. But you know what? The, it, the ball really is in Secretary Clinton's court. You know, she needs to sit down and explain this. If, if everyone's imagining crazy stuff and that they're unfair to her, right. she needs to speak up. And that's the problem is that she issues these press releases, campaign press mm -hmm. releases, and they say it's outrageous that people are suspicious. But, you know, the problem is that she needs to answer this. Well, it's a valid point in that if the intention is to really minimize or shut down the foundation, if she's elected president, then why was it okay to operate the foundation when she was Secretary of State? I, I don't want to get mm -hmm. any of this wrong. I don't want any bad mm -hmm. suspicion. But if she won't sit down and, and provide information, you know, that that's really, you know, she's made that decision and not the rest of us in the media. Good but point. Anyway, Catherine, thank you. You're welcome. And Chairman of the House Oversight Committee, Congressman Jason Chaffetz, turning up the heat on the Clinton email investigation. Chairman Chaffetz firing off a letter to FBI Director James Comey demanding more information about unauthorized people gaining access to classified information on Clinton's private server. Chairman Chaffetz goes on the record. Good evening, sir. Hey, Greta. So you sent a letter yesterday to the FBI Director. What specifically do you want from him you want him to do? Well, I want him to provide more light on the on the problem. This is one of the biggest breaches of classified information uh, that we've had at the at the State Department, and it was done knowingly and willingly. The very day that Hillary Clinton started her her Senate confirmation is when she went to go get this domain name and set this thing up. She created this problem for herself. It was the Inspector General that gave the criminal referral to the FBI that started this investigation, and we want the FBI director to look at those people that Hillary Clinton gave access to this information who did not have a security clearance. There's classified information. It's so classified that even I, as the chairman of the Oversight Committee, I can't see it, but Hillary Clinton gave it to people who don't have a security clearance. All right, two things. One is if there's an innocent explanation for all this, is instead of making us look like we're on a witch hunt, she should speak out, she should give a press conference and answer these questions. Because I don't think anyone of us, at least I don't want to get it wrong. I don't want to get it wrong. And I only have the information I can operate from as we sort of pull teeth and try to get the information out. The second thing, and maybe you know this, her lawyers went through her server, went through her emails and deleted about 30,000 of them. But they went through the full universe, not actually reading all of them, but the header. Did they have security clearance? I mean, this whole process, just going back to the get-go, did they have the appropriate appropriate security clearance to go through her emails with the possibility of a classified one there. We do not believe they had the proper and high enough security clearance in order to go through those emails. She testified under oath, Hillary Clinton, that they had read through and gone through this in great detail. But then the FBI director testified to us in Congress that that was not the case. And so well, again, well, it continues problem, but, to go but, 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 but even before we get there, they have to have the authority to look at classified information. That's the yes. first thing. The second thing, she, which she, I would love, I'd love to hear from her about, is that her lawyers went through and sorted it. They found 30,000 that they said were personal, and knowing that the House wanted them, they then deleted them. 
They made the choice. Look, she's not the head of Fish and Wildlife. She is the head of the Secretary of State. She's dealing in classified information on an hourly basis. It's reasonable to think that her information is chock full of classified information. And it is. And it was. And that's why when she gave access to those attorneys, and by the way, the IT professionals that were also allowed to access that computer, we don't know who these people are. I went into the skiff and go look at these materials. That information is redacted. They shouldn't be holding that information information back from Congress. Who well, are these people that had access to this information? And I take no pleasure in getting it wrong. And so I beg of the campaign, yeah. beg of Secretary Clinton, if yeah. this, you know, if we are all wrong, you know, please hold a press conference and explain it because I don't think anybody in the media wants to get it wrong. But anyway, Congressman, thank you very much. Let me go to the viewers now. Thanks, viewers at, at home, this is your chance on Twitter. Do you think the FBI should reopen the investigation to Secretary Hillary Clinton's emails. Tweet yes or no using hashtag Greta. We'll show you your live Twitter votes throughout the show. And brace yourself. Here comes the mud. The political television ad games are heating up. The RNC releasing their new TV ad about Secretary Clinton. You'll see it next. Also, has Donald Trump changed his mind about how to deal with illegal immigration? Find out from Donald Trump Jr. He's coming up. Late last night, Donald Trump launching his first general election television ad. And today, the RNC releasing a new TV ad aimed right at, you guessed it, Secretary Clinton. The title, Caught Lying Again. The On the Record political panel is here from the Washington Post, Aaron Blake, and from Fortune magazine, Nina Easton. Nina, for six weeks, Donald Trump, and I guess the RNC has been calling Secretary Clinton crooked, lying, um, but the numbers, she doesn't seem to, doesn't seem to impact her on the numbers, or Donald Trump necessarily on the numbers? What's going on? Well, part of what's going on, and by the way, they're going to underscore this, I think, effectively, Republicans and Trump by calling um, for a special prosecutor, as you keep hearing. So they're, like, amping up the, um, the, the argument. That said, you know, she, she's just right about with Donald Trump in the dishonesty um, field in the polls. And the other thing is that people are voting or choosing a candidate in part on temperament. And she comes out much higher on temperament as a commander in chief than he does. He is, there's something like 65% in the latest Fox News poll who don't think he has the right temperament to be um, president. And the big problem he has is with, you know, when you look demographically, you have to look at it demographically. You have to look at, you know, blacks. He's not going to, this isn't going to affect him, his standing with blacks. So you got to look at Latinos. It's not going to affect his standing with Latinos. And then with women, you go back to the temperament thing. He's got this problem with women, and you've got it's almost like a version of this 2004 security moms who are concerned about Donald Trump. Um, having his finger on the button, and that's that's the we, the, the problem they're in right now. Well, even the women thing, Aaron, is that is a, in '08 the women were all behind Secretary Clinton because it was the glass ceiling. Now we have three Supreme Court justices, millennials who can now vote. They they've seen so many women in high positions that they don't have that sort of a, you go girl a right. little bit. And she's not. I mean, she's not doing particularly well with the millennials, as as spectacular as you would expect. So she, the women vote. She's not going. It's not a gift to her. It's not, but I think that on this issue in particular, Donald Trump is disqualifying himself. As much as three-fourths of women have an unfavorable view of Donald Trump. Uh, I, by the way, I do think the crooked Hillary stuff and the questions about her honesty, I think that has been hurting her on a kind of a constant basis. It's just been Donald Trump doing other things that have maybe hurt him more. There are still major questions that the American electorate has about Hillary Clinton's character her honesty, stuff that's going to be furthered by this Clinton Foundation stuff that came out today, the pay-to-play politics that are being alleged. And so I, I think it's not so much that the attacks on Clinton haven't worked as Donald Trump has hurt himself even more and kind of created this problem for himself particularly among women. Look, they're, they're clearly clear concerned. I mean, they're doing damage control over the Clinton Foundation, right? So they're talking about downsizing the Clinton Foundation. President Clinton would step off the board. They wouldn't take donations from corporations. That should be done now, I mean, yeah, you know, should be done know. now. It's the problem. But they understand the optics of this and how, I mean, the polls are going to tighten, and it does it does hurt her to some degree. I, I just always think that what if we did, if she didn't have emails and Trump didn't have Twitter, the temperament thing, what would they, how would they go after each other? It'd be like a... a oh, policy. Oh, policy. Gosh. <laughs> Policy, what a shock. Wait, wait, Look at the numbers. What a shock. 88% think there should be a special prosecutor, although I don't know who's going to point that because that's supposed to be the attorney general. So that's not happening. Uh, FBI investigation is what they want. FBI investigation, 88%. Okay, Nina and Aaron, thank you both. And Donald Trump is about to take on Texas. He's getting ready for a big Austin rally. His son, Donald Trump Jr., is here next.
mission to tackle legal and illegal immigration. And tonight he is sitting down for a town hall with Sean Hannity in Texas to talk immigration and border security. Don't miss that at 10 p.m. Eastern right here on Fox News Channel. So what is Trump's plan? Donald Trump's son, Donald Trump Jr., goes on the record from the set of Sean's big town hall tonight. Nice to see you. How you doing, Greta? Good to be with you. Good to have you. Okay, so give me a preview. When Donald Trump first declared that he was going to be a candidate for president, he told us about the wall. He told us about the fact that he's going to keep people out of the country, Muslims out of the country. Things now seem to have changed a bit. So I must admit, I'm, I'm a little confused. What is his immigration policy? Really, Greg, I don't think anything's changed a bit. I think things have been pretty much the same. Obviously, the media, maybe they're bored because they don't get enough uh, entertainment from Hillary because she's been in hiding for 280-something days. But, you know, ultimately, his plan's basically the same. What he wants to do is make sure that Americans get taken care of first, that we put Americans to work rather than letting everyone else come in here. He wants to take care of Americans, and that's been his plan from day one. That's been his plan consistently. He wants to sure the, make sure that those people are taken care of. He's not anti-immigrant. My mother's an immigrant. His mother's an immigrant. He understands that, but he also understands the rule of law. He realizes that people have to follow laws like they did to get into this country, uh, and that's how it should be done. Does, does that mean that mass deportation of the estimated 11 to 12, 15 million illegal is off the table? Does it mean it's off the table? I, I don't know. You know, I don't know the exact details of it. You know, in terms of that, but he's going to always do something humanely. He's a good guy. He's a caring guy. But in the end. He has to care about Americans first. That's the job of the president. And when I look at the administration currently, and when I look at who we're running against, I feel most of the time that they're more concerned about taking care of people from other parts of the world, people from countries that hate our guts, people that would love to wipe us off the face of the earth. They're war more worried about their feelings than they are Americans. We're here to put Americans back to work. We're here to build up Americans, to take care of all Americans of all ethnicities, all backgrounds, and make sure that in their country, they take precedent. And I think uh, that's right, pretty common. That's just common sense, Greta. Uh, right around the corner are these debates. And I'm curious whether or not uh, Donald has begun to focus on these debates, whether he's preparing for them, reading material. Has he started to look at the debates? You know, he certainly has. I mean, he's looking at that. He's thinking about it, but he's living that day to day. I mean, he's hearing what the American people have to say. He's been I've been saying it for a long time. Brother. He's giving them a voice again. Uh, our politicians have largely forgotten the American people. They're catering to their special interests. They're catering to the people, foreign and domestic, giving you know millions and hundreds of millions of dollars to their various foundations. You know, that's not what my father's about. My father's about hearing the American worker, the hardworking people who made this country great, who built this incredible nation. He's about making sure that they have a voice again. And so right, he, he's hearing from them on a daily basis as he travels the country, and that's his debate prep. Often here on, on the record, I talk about LBJ's war on poverty that he declared in 1965 and which has been a dreadful failure. We have lost that war on poverty. He spoke the other night to African Americans who live in many of these inner city areas that are very poor. What, what, difference, what would he do differently for these inner cities to try to win this war on poverty? that we have so far lost dreadfully. Well, listen, again, the Democrats certainly have a stronghold uh, you know, on those cities. But if you look at their policies, as you said, starting from LG LBJ, it's been a total disaster. I mean, it's created a vicious cycle that has kept people in poverty, that has kept people so away from jobs. So what would he do? Kept people, he, first of all, I think he, he'd create law and order. I mean, he's been a you know, vocal advocate for that. You, you have to have law and order. You can't have cities and you know, towns that are run by gangs uh, and, and thugs uh, and people who are afraid to ultimately prosecute them. I think you need law and order. Then you have to focus on education. Education, making sure that those people get the same chances of a good education, you know, not an education system that's ruled you know, from D.C. that can't understand the inner workings of those cities that have never even been in the inner cities. Uh, you have to give people an education so that they can get out of that cycle. Uh, it, it's not an easy task, but it's something that he's going to do. And you know, I, I think he's frankly said it best. Look at the policies that the Democrats have given them. Look at where you are today if you live in those communities. You're no better off than you were you know, two decades ago, let alone eight years ago, and candidly, you're probably worse off in most cases. So it's about making sure that those people have an opportunity, the same opportunity that you and I want for our kids uh, and, and grandkids. We want to make sure that those people get that same chance. Thank you very much for joining us. And a note to the viewers uh, one more time. Do not miss the Sean Hannity Town Hall tonight at 10 p.m. with Donald Trump, 10 p.m. Eastern, right here on the Fox News Channel.
Get ready to speed read the news. Remember former Stanford swimmer Brock Turner? He was sentenced to six months in jail for raping a passed out drunk classmate. Well, now Stanford University is making some changes. The university is banning hard liquor for undergraduates on campus parties. Beer and wine can still be served. Turner blamed his criminal behavior on being too drunk. And watch this wild video showing a drug bust on the high seas. Italian police chasing two suspects on high-speed jet skis. Officers use a speedboat to catch up. One suspect arrested. Police finding nearly 500 pounds of marijuana. The other suspect got away. And guys, take note. This is not the way to impress a girl. A university, a Pittsburgh student got himself stuck between two buildings. The 22-year-old was showing off to a young woman by jumping roof to roof. Unfortunately for him, he fell between two buildings and got wedged in a 16 to 18 inch wide space. Police had to break through the walls of a restaurant to get to the young man. No word if his female friend was impressed. He'd read. And this is disgusting. A possible ISIS beheading right here in the United States. On the record investigates next. Plus, President Obama heading to Louisiana. Did he make the right decision by waiting? That's coming up. This is gruesome, and it's also disgusting, and it's disgraceful. A possible ISIS beheading right here in America. The FBI is investigating a stabbing in Roanoke, Virginia, as a possible terror attack, and it gets worse. The suspect may have tried to behead one of the victims. On the records, Griff Jenkins is on the ground in Roanoke investigating this horrific crime. Griff? That's right, Greta. Shortly after 8 p.m. Saturday night, police say the 20-year-old Wasil Faruqi attacked a couple coming home in this apartment complex over my shoulder. The couple live on the top uh, floor of what is a three-story apartment complex. He apparently attacked them with a knife. It appears to have been random. And the FBI, of course, investigating because multiple witnesses to what happened here said that Faruqi was shouting Allah Akbar or God is great, often heard in acts of terrorism. We were able to speak with uh, one of the neighbors here who lives directly across from the couple that was attacked. Her name is Angel Von Baron. Here's what she told us. I saw a lot of blood on the rail down there on that second landing. And a rag looked like it might have been part of her shirt. Okay, this is so no one was fighting in the stairwell. You saw what I was a out. trail of blood. Yeah. Where would there's blood on this? There was blood there and over here. So it looked like signs of a struggle. Yes. And it sounded like it, but I thought it was kids at first mm -hmm. running up and down the stairs and that's not what it was. Now, Faruqi fled this scene. The husband was able to fight him off, but he was ap actually apprehended at a local area hospital where the victims were, and that's where police took him in custody. We spoke with Roanoke County Assistant Police Chief Chuck Mason. Here's what he had to say. As far as we can tell, uh, there was no connection between the victims and the suspect. They had never seen him before. Um, it appears to us to be a, a random attack. Uh, there has been, I'm aware of some speculation that this was an attempted beheading. Um, both victims were stabbed and cut repeatedly. And the male victim did in fact suffer a, uh, a severe laceration to the side of his neck, but there was nothing that appeared to be uh, an attempt at a, at a beheading. The local officer who lives in this apartment complex behind me, who did not want to be named or go on camera, told me that he leapt into action with his training to try and save their lives. The husband is out of the hospital. The wife remains critically injured. The FBI, of course, investigating, and Faruqi in jail awaiting a hearing on September 1st. Greta? Griff, thank you. And today, President Obama seen firsthand the horrific Louisiana flood damage. The president took some heat from critics, including Donald Trump, for not going sooner. But the Republican governor of Louisiana told President Obama to wait. Fox News correspondent Will Carr is live in Baton Rouge with how residents received the president. Will? Good evening, Greta. We're driving down the streets here. I want to give you a visual of the exact thing that President Obama saw just a few hours ago. Piles of debris, as one resident put it to me, thousands of memories that have been dragged to the curb. 145,000 homes damaged, estimated 
30 billion dollars. We're told it's going to take years for this area to recover. President Obama today touring the area and telling the community every resource is available. He also took the time to meet with Alton Sterling's family and the families of the slain police officers from this area. Some residents questioning if that was the right time because they think this disaster really has pulled this community together and they don't want to focus on the schisms that happened before it. At the same time, we're seeing so many examples of selflessness. One man whose family lost everything has been cooking chicken stew in this neighborhood neighborhood and then handing it to neighbors. Uh, and then there are the five high school football players who go to East Ascension High School in the Baton Rouge area here. They had a four-hour practice in 105 degree weather today. Then they went to one of the neighbors around here and helped him pull out all of his items for six hours. Just a short time ago, they went home. They're going to get dinner, go to sleep. They have practice again tomorrow. Then they plan to go to a widow's house and do the same thing. So two examples of the strength that we're seeing as this recovery continues. Greta. Well, thank you. And not too happy with the 2016 candidates? The doctor may have a cure. Green Party presidential candidate Dr. Jill Stein is here next. I would love to carry this movement forward and bring it to the American people who have rejected these two candidates, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, in unprecedented numbers. These are the most untrusted and disliked presidential candidates in history. The American people not only have a right to vote, they have a right to know who they can vote for. And I think the next steps are to ensure that we have media with integrity that are actually covering real choices. And thank you for being here today. That was Dr. Jill Stein, the Green Party's nominee for president. Yes, there are more people than just Donald Trump and Secretary Hillary Clinton running for president. Jill Stein, eight doctors on the ballot in 32 states, including Washington, D.C., and she says we need a third option for president. Majority of voters has rejected Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump and are clamoring for something else. So who are those on top to be giving marching orders to, you know, uh, voters to be good little boys and girls? Politicians do not have a new form of entitlement. They are not entitled to our votes. They have to earn our votes. And Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump have not earned our vote. Green Party candidate for President of the United States, Dr. Jill Stein, is here to go on the record. Nice to see you, Doctor. Great to see you, Greg. Uh, before I find out what your passion is and your uh, and your political ideology, uh, why just in a soundbite, um, why shouldn't someone vote for Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump? Well, they have to earn your vote, and so far they haven't. The Either majority. One? Yes, the, I mean, the polls show that the majority of American voters dislike and distrust both those candidates at record numbers and are clamoring for someone else. Are they lousy candidates? Uh, in my view, they are. They are a continuation of the system that we have that has thrown the American people under the bus. They've sent our jobs overseas, and, you know, Hillary has a track record. Donald has sent his jobs overseas, although he's complaining about the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, but that's what he's been doing. Uh, he says... Uh, terrible and frightening things. He's a fear monger and a, and a hate monger and a war monger. But Hillary has a track record for doing most of what Donald is talking okay. about. What is your passion? You're a Harvard educated doctor. Why did you become a candidate for President of the United States? I am a mother on fire and we have a younger generation that really does not have a future. They don't have jobs. They are locked into student loan debt which is not payable in the economy that we have and the climate is collapsing on their heads. Uh, you know, I'm as a medical doctor, I'm now practicing practicing political medicine because it's the mother of all illnesses and if we want to fix the things that are literally killing us we need to heal our sick political system. All right, you're on 32 ballots, which is big. That's a lot of More mistakes. than that now. Okay. It's now up, uh, I believe it's 40 at this point, and climbing. Right. So we expect to be on just about every ballot. All right, it would really help you to get your message out to if you could get on that debate stage. Yes. That doesn't look like it's going to happen the way you're well, polling. Well, but we, you know, that polling is predicated on uh, having no visibility in big media, and only in the last week have we begun to get a window. We actually did a an hour and a half long uh, uh, forum, town hall forum on CNN. We were uh, number one on on Twitter uh, in that forum. There's enormous interest out there in our campaign, and I would dare anyone who says that there's not interest host a town forum, a town hall forum for us, and let's see how much interest right. there is. Obamacare, everyone's going to unfortunately get sick. People are worried about it. Some insurance companies are now leaving the market because we know competition is going to drive prices up. Very yes. succinctly, yes. what would you do about Obamacare, if anything? 
So Obamacare had failed even before it was implemented. We had it in Massachusetts, my home state. We called it Romney Care before it was Obamacare. And we knew that prices simply skyrocketed, that people who were truly sick didn't get covered. There are all kinds of holes in it. We need a simple system, a Medicare for all system. You basically drop the age of eligibility for Medicare. You patch up the holes that have been knocked into it. It has really low overhead, about 2%, as opposed to our current system where it's more like 20 percent. Half of a trillion dollars a year of our health care dollars are actually going into paper pushing, bureaucracy, into big CEO salaries, uh, not into health care. We can streamline this bureaucracy with a single payer system uh, and be able to afford comprehensive health care for everyone as a human right. Tax code. Everyone's mad. There are 3,300 uh, special interests in this tax code, and even the members of Congress who passed the tax code can't do their own taxes. What would you do about the tax code? Um, well, number one, the tax code is extremely unfair in addition to being extremely complicated. So we need to make a fair tax code. You know, I think... Is that like flat tax, a regressive tax, a sales tax, consumption tax, value-added tax? Where are you? Yeah, I mean, there's all, you know, kind. that's currently what we have, except for the uh, so-called consumption tax. But we have a plethora of taxes, and they are largely regressive, so that the burden falls on middle income and working people and poor people, for Could, that what matter. Would you, how would you change that? Uh, I would make taxes more progressive. I would ensure that the wealthy are paying their fair share. Because but they're already paying. Some are paying over 50% when you add all these state taxes. I mean, it's, I don't know where all these deductions are that everybody's getting. I mean, Bernie Sanders paid 13%, by the way, I think it was. Did you know that? I think it was uh, a, he paid pretty low. I, I know it was, you know, it, Maybe wasn't, it wasn't up 30, there. Yeah. I think it was around 20% or well, something like that. But still, that's low. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I think, yeah, we need to eliminate the unfair deductions. We need to ensure that the people who are really benefiting from this society are paying into it. Like, for example, do you know how many lawsuits Donald Trump has? I, Donald Trump has, has been involved in 3,500 lawsuits over the last couple of decades, and he's apparently not paying taxes. I, so what's way, wrong I, with know this what? picture? He's bankrupting know, I, our legal I don't, system. I don't know if he's paying tax shot. We haven't seen his tax returns, and I've been critical. He needs to show his tax he returns. Does. Hillary Clinton yes. needs to show her, tra her, right. uh, her speech transcripts, and we need more information from everybody. But anyway, thank you very much for joining us, and good luck. Great to be with you. And coming up, this is what happens when you're not in the tabloids. I'll tell you off the record. Road happy. Let's go off the record. There is much going on from catastrophic floods in Louisiana, killing 13 people, destroying tens of thousands of homes, to Secretary Hillary Clinton campaigning, even making an appearance on Jimmy Kimmel's show, to Donald Trump also campaigning, and yes, even tweeting, which always captivates the attention of many. And in the midst of all that's going on, Donald Henderson died. Who? Yeah, that's what I thought. Who's Donald Henderson? Well, I decided to find out, and when I did, I thought, shame on me. Dr. Donald A. Henderson died last week at age 87. I didn't even know who he was. You probably didn't either. But the world owes him an enormous amount of gratitude. This Baltimore resident was the leader of one of mankind's most important public health feats, the eradication of smallpox. Smallpox killed millions of people, and nothing was going to stop smallpox from killing millions more, except for... Dr. Donald Henderson. There are many great people who do spectacular things, but they never appear on TV, never in the tabloids, so we never get to know them to thank them. That is Dr. Donald A. Henderson. So tonight, for all of us, I thank him, and I sure hope his family's watching. And that's my off-the-record comment tonight. And it's time... For your campaign flash, get ready. Donald Trump is about to speak in Austin, Texas. And then at 10 p.m. Eastern, watch the Trump Town Hall on Hannity. Secretary Hillary Clinton holding a fundraiser at Justin Timberlake's Los Angeles home. And you can bet it was star-studded. Timberlake tweeting this photo with Secretary Clinton and his wife, Jessica Biel. And VP nominee Governor Mike Pence stopping for a haircut. Governor Pence was near Philadelphia when he needed a trim. But awkwardly, after the 20-minute haircut, the barber had to ask Pence's name. And that's your campaign flash. Live Twitter voting results on your screen right now. Do you think the FBI should be should reopen the investigation of Secretary Hillary Clinton's emails? And the result, 87 yes, no, 13 percent. That's all for now. Good night from Washington, D.C. Go to my Facebook page. I have a special video there.